everyone, and welcome to week five of our The Answers to Your Deepest Longings, 40 Days Through the Bible. I have Hannah with me, who is my co-host, but today she's in a little bit of a different seat, and you'll find out why in a little bit. And then I have Eric Gagnon. How do we feel about that? You feel like I did Sounds a great, great job at your last name? Thank you. His last name is a tricky one, everybody. But you are the Theological Content Manager for the First Five app, correct? That is right. That is right. And Eric was on our content team for this study. And so that means he got to write a little bit. You got to check a few things for theology. And so, Eric, I'm going to put you in the hot seat, but did you enjoy working on this project? <laughs> I can't say no, but absolutely yes. This is probably the most significant thing that I've ever worked on. Hmm. Well, you did a wonderful job, and so we're excited to hear from you in a little bit. And so this week, we have, we actually just finished four weeks of the Old Testament. Can you believe it? Great job, everybody. Yes. A round of applause. That Pat is no joke. And now we are in the Gospels for yes. week five, and so we're really excited about that. Last week, we talked about rescue, and this week, we get to see God's grander plan of redemption. So we're looking at the longing of redemption. All right, we'll get to see how the ultimate rescuer came to earth this week. And Hannah, I want to talk to you a little bit about, you wrote this week of content, correct? Yes. And you got a little emotional writing this week. Um, and so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why that is and, yeah. and what that means. Yes. So what's so funny, you guys, is whenever we decided to do this project, I signed up to write, if you've now had your study guide for a couple of weeks, there's a week in reflection and prayer at the end. And I signed up to do two of those, and then it turned into two weeks of content with the reflection and prayer as well. And so, um, but it's been so amazing. And so with the mentorship and guidance of Wendy Blight and the rest of our content team, like Eric and Joel and Lisa, I got to help write a part of this, and so it's been such an honor. I want you to know that the everyday girl was representing you um, in that room. And so with that, when we got to this week, I got to write it. And so um, there is a little bit of nervousness and excitedness yeah. for, for this week. All right, everyone. So we're going to set up a little bit of what Hannah wrote this week. And so we're going to look at the transfiguration from Matthew 17. And just through talking through various conversations and watching the content team right in the conference room of the Proverbs office, I know that it kind of got a little emotional for you. And it was a little difficult because, well, I'm not going to explain it. Why did it make <laughs> you emotional? And why was it a little difficult for you when it comes to the transfiguration? So, okay, if you... We're going to go maybe towards the end of this week a little bit. And so um, Matthew 17, we see the transfiguration of Jesus. And what that means is truly to transfigure. Like that's what that means. And so it's pretty simple. And so um, the last week that we saw Moses was back in the week three of Deuteronomy. So we're going to go back a little bit. And the reason this makes me emotional is the last time that we saw Moses in De Deuteronomy 34, um, he dies without making it into the promised land. And yeah, we just need to stop because that literally throws me off every single time. He seems so obe he seems so obedient. Right. Eric, if you were Moses <clears throat> and you were told you couldn't get into the promised land, what would you feel? Well, actually, I just finished reading the book of Exodus just last night and I was wow. amazed at the amount of times when Moses seriously talks back to God <laughs> is a lot. <laughs> like we tend to like not really see it the first few times, but I think Moses probably realized that God was just in his judgments. Wow. Okay, okay. Wow. I would be very upset. But oh. then again, I have not just finished Exodus, so maybe I'd have a different perspective. Right. But, Han, yes. sorry. Yes, no, you're just fine. To stop and oh, talk about absolutely. That. And so in Numbers 20, um, where Moses was told by the Lord to speak to the rock, and instead of speaking to the rock, you know, sometimes whenever you're angry, maybe you like hit your phone a little harder, or you press the power button a little more hard <laughs> on your laptop. Um, he struck the rock twice instead of speaking to the rock. And so in that moment, the Lord tells Moses that he will not bring the people into the promised land. And so that was something that I have struggled with for years. I cannot wrap my mind around it. And so what I love is that um, we're just going to, we're going to leave it at that of that's where we feel like Moses leaves off is being told he's not making it into right. the promised land. We see him die. Um, but in Matthew 17, we get to see a really, really sweet moment with Moses. And so um, I feel like it's very relatable. There are moments in our lives yeah. where we have sinned or we have done the opposite of what the Lord has told us to do. And it's 
devastating for us. It's devastating for him. We know that. Um, but thankfully, we're not being told that we can't make it into the promised land. Right. And that's hard of like looking at Moses. Of He did this one thing. And Eric is now teaching us he did more than one thing. <laughs> um, but to what we have read, it looks like Moses just did this one thing that changed everything for him. Right. Um, and that would be really, really hard. But through the grace of Jesus, um, we get to have this beautiful redemption and know that um, Jesus' death and resurrection brought redemption for all sin for us. Yes, and so I love a good cliffhanger. So we're going to see how that was, that was redeemed. Moses' story was redeemed, um, and we'll read about that this week. But we're going to switch gears because we've talked a lot about content. You guys have been digging into the study guide and God's Word a lot. And so we're going to switch gears and talk to Eric about the visuals that you see in the study guide, because Eric, you had a little bit of a hand in what that looks like, and so we would love for you to talk about it a little bit. Sure. Well, I've always been a visual learner. I think a lot of us can relate with that. Maybe a little bit of ADD, ADHD, I don't know. I've never been diagnosed with that, but I know that I had a hard time focusing when I was in school. Mm -hmm. And I actually would, I remember this, that uh, most of my classes, you get a handout or something, first thing I would always try to do is just start doodling on the back of the thing, mm -hmm. even while the teacher was teaching. And actually that was helping me listen. Mm -hmm. Teachers didn't really know that. They <laughs> thought I wasn't paying attention. I was just goofing off. And so the, sometimes they would take away the paper or whatever. And they didn't realize that was helping me, helping me to learn. And then uh, sort of fast forward to um, Bible school where I had a professor who is a, uh, an expert in communication and he would always teach that no matter what you're doing, whether you're writing, whether you're speaking, to always, always use illustrations. Like, not just visual illustrations, but, but verbal illustrations, any kind of illustrations, because it helps us remember, it helps us to learn. Uh, Jesus was always, you know, giving illustrations. And uh, it's, an, it's the reason why, you know, out of everything I say, the thing that you probably remember the most today is that I doodled in class. <laughs> Um, because you remember that. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we, we see illustrations in, in Bible studies and things, but um, I thought it would be important to have those throughout and help people really, really remember the content in here. That's awesome. So you'll see something like an apple core, and we just talked about the whale that's in it. And so do you have a favorite image? Well, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to name a favorite. You know, they're all my darlings. But yeah. Um, design, actually, I have to give them full credit. I, I gave them maybe some inspiration, and the, the one that sticks out to me the most is probably the apple core, yeah. although for all of you, uh, you Bible scholars out there, I realize it probably wasn't an apple, but it's got that visual mm. where we think of a fruit being eaten, right. um, stands out, pops out in your mind. Maybe it was a pomegranate or something like that. There we go. Well, good, Eric. Well, thank you so much for explaining that, and then, yeah, our design team did a wonderful job putting all those visuals in there, and so so thanks, Eric, for explaining. That was great. All right, so now we're on to one of our favorite parts yes. of each video. It's called 60 Second Theology with Joel. And so, Eric, I don't know if you know what we're doing, so I'm going to explain it to you, and maybe you have not seen many of these videos, but 60 Second Theology is a segment where we ask our director of theology and research a question, and he has 60 seconds to answer. So this week, Joel, we want to know, what's the significance of the number 40? Good luck. All right, so when we study theology, one of the things that we study is a thing called numerology, which means that the Israelites viewed numbers in symbolic features. And so the number 40 typically represented temptation, trials, or testing. So for instance, uh, we find that the Israelites find themselves in the wilderness for 40 years. It's a time of testing. We find um, also that Elijah was in the wilderness for 40 days. Again, a time of testing. But it's not just excluded to the Old Testament, the New Testament. Jesus himself is a better Elijah because he is tested in the wilderness and tempted by the devil. That's 40 days. And then notice this. Jesus is outside hanging out with all of the people post-resurrection for how long? A period of 40 days. But then it's not just 40. It's also the numerical value of 40 and the multiples of it. For instance, between Malachi and Matthew, there's how many years of silence? 400 years of silence. There you go. Testing and trials. Oh my gosh, can you believe that? <laughs> no. Like, he, truly. He got it right right there at the last second. He went into testing and trials, and it's just always amazing. When he says something, I'm like, oh no. There's and just all, no way. And the significance of 40, all of the different times that he mentioned it throughout scripture. I mean, round of applause. Yes, great, great job. Great job. <laughs> See, there we go. 
All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us for another week. We're excited for what you're going to learn, especially when it comes to the transfiguration. And just something we say around here is when you know the truth and live the truth, it changes everything. So have a wonderful, wonderful week. Bye, y'all.